Hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, hi. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's far more interaction than I get from my average master's class. Uh, my name's Tim Miller. I'm an associate professor of computer science here at the, the university, and I'm director of learning in the, the School of Computing and Information Systems. Beside me is Uwe Aiklin, who's at the head of school and professor also of computer science here, and we're going to talk a little bit about um, why it's a good idea to come and study um, IT here at Melbourne and use it with your undergraduate degree. So I'm going to start off a little bit. Uwe is going to talk about why he thinks you, this is a good idea to come and study here at Melbourne. Okay, shall I go? Okay, so I wanted to personally welcome all of you. So I'm Professor Uwe Ekelin. I'm the head of School of Computing and Information Systems, which means I'm ultimately the person responsible for all the academic matters in this area. So that's teaching, research, engagement, outreach, all the things we do these days. And I just wanted to say a few words just from my maybe personal perspective, why I think uh, Melbourne is a very good place to study computing and information systems. And then Tim will tell you a few more of the details. So for me, and this is also actually the reason why I'm here myself, it's about the staff. You have the best staff in the country and some of the best computer scientists in the world working here. And that makes all the difference because we don't hide them away in the labs. We actually use all our professors for frontline teaching. Last semester, one of our top professors was teaching the 101 Introduction to Computing. This semester, another one of our top professors is teaching the Introduction to Computing. So you immediately get access to the world experts. And as a result of that, not only will you find out about the hot topics of today, which might be artificial intelligence, for example, and we keep talking about what that might actually mean, and uh, cybersecurity, and maybe blockchain, and the things that perhaps you know already, but you also get access to the topics of tomorrow. And I think that's unique here. So for example, we are just talking about quantum computing and how working with IBM, we will have a, an actual real quantum computer that no other place has, and we can use that. I'll be talking about other things like digital ethics. Blockchain technology is all very interesting, but where is this going from a more ethical and legal point of view? So these are the topics that our top staff are working on, and you get access to them through their teaching. So I think that makes a big difference here. So, Tim, maybe you will. Take my go. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So, well, and I'll, I'm, I'm around all day. Um, I'll be here. You can ask me any questions about teaching, research, whatever you're interested in. I'll be just here. Um, thanks very much, Uwe. So, Uwe talked a little bit about why this school so uh, such a great school in computer science, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how we quantify that. But I want to talk a little bit about why would studying computer science or IT at Melbourne, or well, in general, would be a good idea. And so there's basically three reasons why I think studying computer science is a good idea. Is one, because it's a fantastically interesting subject. It's exceedingly engaging. It's a lovely blend of science, maths, engineering, design, psychology in some regards. And it's the fastest moving field in the history of mankind. So it's really a great time to be in this field. I, I really enjoy it as a researcher. I'm also a researcher in artificial intelligence like at Uwe and a lot of our staff are. It's really a great time to be to be studying this. So it's it's, it's a great subject, and I would just I, I would just study it irrelevant of the other two points I'm about to tell you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the second point is it's really quite in demand. This is a skill. So can I see a show of hands? Put your hand up if you have a computer in your house. I imagine most of you do. So keep it up if you have two or more. Three or more. Four. More, more, down to four, some, a few people with four. Okay. So when I asked that, how many of you included this as a computer? A few of you? Right. Okay. That's a computer. That's more powerful than the desktop you would have had on your desk ten years ago, probably eight years ago. And that's a computer. It's, it, it defined, the definition of a computer is some programmable device that we can interact with. It's exactly a computer. But even when you're trying to set up your, your TiVo to record a program, because you're here today, that's a computer, that's a programmable device that people interact with. And when you came here on the train today, there was some traffic lights that signaled where the trains can go. That was all software control. There's a computer inside that. Your car has it involved. Software is everywhere. And software is a huge part of our day, and you interact with it on a, on a sort of minute-to-minute -minute level almost, a part of your day. And all of, that, all of that infrastructure, all that software has to be developed by real people. Okay? And it's a very hard problem to do this, and it requires a really huge workforce to do it. So it's very much in demand, right? Good computer scientists are not going to be out of a job when they graduate. And the third is, 
just income. It's, it's a really good income earner. Right now, people coming out of our master's degrees and more than a starting salary is more than just about any other master's degree at the university, including from commerce and even from some medical fields. But in general, if you want to think about, oh, I'm just, just, I don't just want to earn a good basic income, I, I want to be really rich, it's a really good field for that as well. So if you live in Australia right now and you want to be a millionaire, the best way to become a millionaire is to be born into a family that owns an iron ore mine and passes that richness on to you. But I'm going to say that most of you aren't born there. The second best way is to be a tech entrepreneur. And more than 80% of tech entrepreneurs are IT tech entrepreneurs developing software because it's not a lot of effort to get something started up and put it on an app store and sell that. And we've had students who have become millionaires before they finish their masters by, by writing games and stuff like this. So it's incredibly interesting. It's in high demand and you will be able to earn very good income from it. Three reasons why I think it's a great time to study computer science anywhere. But how do you study IT at Melbourne is what I'm going to talk about today. And as these slides have been prepared for me, I think there's a bit, bit too many to get through in half an hour, so I'm going to focus on a couple of important points um, today. <clears throat> so first off, we look at computing and information systems. That's Uwe is the head of school of computing and information systems. I'm a member of this, roughly 60 academic staff, probably 50 or 60 research staff, and 180 PhD students in the school. Uh, and we're the top school, computer science school in the country, and we have been for a number of years. And by a pretty safe margin, ANU and Canberra is our closest competitor, also a very, very good computer science school here. But we're, we're a very strong school, and it's mostly, as Uwe said, it's due that we have really good staff and me as well. And we have really strong staff, and that just doesn't mean in research we have really good staff that are also in teaching. It's, it's the same staff, right? We strive really hard to be good teachers. But it's also because we have good employability uh, outcomes as measured by employers, not by, by us. So we have strong research, strong teaching, we have really good links with industry and good employability. And that's what makes us number one in, in the country. But we're also number 14 in the world in computer science. That we're even more proud of, because here we're competing against Oxford and Cambridge and MIT and Harvard, National University of Singapore, these types of universities, top institutes in the world, and we rank really quite high. It's pretty hard to compete with MIT when they've got three times as many staff, but you know, we're, we rank very high and we're really very proud of that and it's for the same reasons, okay? Great research, great teaching, great employability outcomes, really good networks with industry. Okay, so other than our rankings, why else? Well, being industry connected, we're number seven in the world as a university for employability outcomes, okay? Not just our school but the university as a whole, okay? And that's because we have got, a, I think, a very good balance of foundational theory practice and industry linkage across our degrees, across the, the undergraduate and master's degrees. Um, so our curriculum is very closely aligned with industry. As a director of learning, you know, sort of every year we're doing reviews with industry on what's relevant and changing our degrees, putting forward new majors, these types of things in order to align better with industry. But also other things like industry project and internships, innovation challenges where you have mentors with industry. It's, it's really active in engineering as a school as a whole today, engineering and IT. Um, internationally recognised, the undergraduate degree, which is where I, met, I think all of you are coming into, our degrees are accredited by the Australian Computer Science Society. Um, at the master's level, so for example, our Master of Software Engineering, which is where most of our undergrads would go on if they went to master's, that's accredited by the Australian Computer Science Society, as well as Engineers Australia and EuroInf, which is the European body, the only, the only degree in Australia that's accredited by EuroInf, which means you can practice in Europe as a, an accredited engineer. Uh, and the flexibility is one of the things that really stands Melbourne out right now, although that's becoming less and less as people are starting to copy our model a bit more. Okay, so around about, in around about 2005, Glyn Davis, the Vice Chancellor, made a bet that in the, in the coming future, what employers were gonna want was not just strong technical people, but strong technical people who could also communicate, work in teams, communicate with non-technical people, work in teams, having a much broader mindset. And this is where the Melbourne model came out. You'll notice when we look a little bit at the degree structure later, you're kind of encouraged and in fact in some way pushed and forced to study things that are not within your core expertise. And I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. And that flexibility is not only good for students, it allows you to try a few different things, but it also changes the way you think and builds your, your skills. Um, so in IT, we're sort of 
we're sort of world leading, we're number 14 in the world. A lot of that is, around about 40% of that is based on our research. And we, and this is just some selection of projects we have in research. For example, how to age in a virtual world? How do we support older people who are stuck at home by themselves and are socially isolated? How can we get technology in order to sort of help them feel less socially isolated? Um, we've got projects on insertable technology, which are small chips you implant, for example, under your skin that you can use that have sensors in them and these kind of things that you can use to interact with the world. We've touched on the digital connectivity, crime and privacy. We're now generating more data in each year than we pretty much have generated for the entire of humanity. We're doing this every year and this, this data comes, this is mostly data about people and companies are using this to infer things about people. What are the privacy and ethical considerations of those things? <coughs> Greener cloud computing. If you sort of follow the trends, you know actually that most of the computing that goes on is not done on desktops anymore. It's done on other people's machines called the cloud where you actually process a whole lot of data on someone else's machine. For example, Amazon, Google, they have these farms of machines. But actually it's now saying that, well, that's burning a lot of energy. Can we, can we do that in a much more energy efficient way? And of course, artificial intelligence is probably more than a third of our staff are, are AI researchers. <clears throat> um, but what do we sort of mean by information technology? Now, we use information technology as kind of a banner for our school because we study a whole range of activities from really quite low-level computer organization and networking and algorithmic stuff all the way up to business information systems, which is how do you use technology to support your business. In our school, we're very broad, so we use information technology as a way to do that. But what we really study is four subject, four subject areas, which is computer science, the foundational computer science of algorithms, networks, artificial intelligence, these types of things. We study software engineering, which is how do we use that basic science to engineer large-scale systems, you know, like air traffic control that take several years and teams of 20 people to build. To human-computer interaction, which is how do people interact with their devices or their monitors or virtual reality masks in a one-to-one -one fashion, up to business information systems, which is how's an organisation does information technology influence our business and what information technology should we have in our business in order to better run it? And we, we teach across all of those spectrums in our, in our, um, in our degrees, especially at master's level. Um, what we don't sort of do here is sort of foundational, what, what would be considered IT is things like network administration, systems administration, setting up PCs, setting up printers and those types of things, a very valuable role, but it's not really a scientific or engineering style role that we have here. We don't study those types of things here, which you, you wouldn't need a, a Bachelor of Science to do. We're really about the, the knowledge economy. Um, so really briefly, I'm going to talk about options to study at an undergraduate level here. Effectively, you can do it through two degrees. If you want to study this as a major, you can go into the Bachelor of Design or the Bachelor of Science. We talk a bit about the difference between these, but we have different majors within those. Now, if you're familiar with the Melbourne model, uh, you'll know that, for example, if you would like to major in computing and software systems, which is where I imagine most people here would be thinking to major, that's our biggest major in the school, you enroll in a Bachelor of Science. And the day you enrol, you, you don't choose that major. At least we don't ask you to choose it. You may have chosen it. Uh, what you do is you take the subjects that lead towards that major. And at Melbourne, what we have is in these degrees here, you don't have to make up your mind until at the very earliest, halfway through your second year, which means you can keep other pathways open. You can say, I don't know if I want to study computing or biology yet. Um, I can just take both for a short while and, and try them both out. But things like computing and software systems and data science, they're so closely related, you can actually leave it until your third year to decide which one you major in. And the design, Bachelor of Design is the same. You don't choose, you just enrol into the degree and then you pick up the right subjects. And once you're in that degree, provided you're able to satisfy the prerequisites of the subjects, you can major in whatever you want. Okay? So this gives an, an enormous amount of flexibility in these degrees here. And I'll talk a little bit about the difference between these in a minute. Well, totally, you can study IT as breadth in any Melbourne degree. We'll talk about breadth in a little bit, but effectively we have subjects that people can take if they're not going to be a computer scientist. They just want to learn about this because it's really valuable to know these skills in just about any job right now. And then we have a diploma of computing, which is um, very similar to the breadth degree, but you, you actually take a little bit more subjects and it adds an extra semester. But I imagine most of you here are interested in these two options, so we're going to focus on them today. 
And importantly, what we have to want to say is there's no prior experience. We don't expect you to know how to do computer programming. You start off on day one. If you know how to do computer programming, you can opt. You can take a test that you can skip that first subject. But everybody else, we assume you have never done computer programming at all. Okay, so computing and software systems. This is the main major we see people taking, and this is all about you know really what foundational computer science, such as programming, algorithms, database systems, networks, artificial intelligence, the kind of stuff that people might imagine as the, what you do sitting down. But also we touch a little bit on creating and managing larger systems. I used uh, air traffic control as an example here. That's a lot of people, maybe a team of 10 or 20 people over three or four years to put together even a basic system that can do air traffic control. How do they manage all that? How do they design their software such that they're not stepping on each other's toes and they can put it all together again at the end? That's a, we touch on those types of things, but really it's the Master of Software Engineering where you will learn much more about that. Uh, yeah, you can study computing um, through two options, as I said, design or science. I'll talk a little bit about the differences here. And both of those options will lead you to a Master of Engineering, which is, the, I guess, the default mode most people take um, after their three years with a major in software or software as business, which is a, a slight variant. There's also a Master of Computer Science that you can opt into, which is similar entry conditions, um, quite different to the Master of Software Engineering, but this is the default pathway we see people taking. Um, but to study that, you can go through Design, Bachelor of Design, or Bachelor of Science. What do are, what are we sort of sell as the difference? They are very similar. Some of them are exactly the same subjects, and no matter which degree you're in, you'll be sitting in the same classroom as other people. But there's a few different subjects. Okay. Now, what I would say is the foundational difference is in a Bachelor of Design versus Science is the electives you have access to. You can do some electives. Some of those electives will have to be outside of computer science, at least in the first couple of years. And you can take design electives in design, or you can take science electives in science. So in design, you might take graphic design or architecture or something way different. In science, you may take genetics, something very different. Um, but technically, there's also a slight difference, which I'd say the Bachelor of Design, we're looking more at kind of front end and designing for usability. So we're looking at how do you program systems, you know, that are kind of mobile applications or desktop applications or web applications and that kind of front end level stuff. Whereas it can, in the science degree, we're looking, I would say, more at the back end stuff. So what are the algorithms that process all that data at the end and how can we process <coughs> terabytes of data in a fraction of a second? We're looking at those types of things. But both of them are fundamentally about algorithms and building software, just a slight difference of focus. Um, and both of them have options of going on to engineering, software engineering. Um, now I want to talk, I want to step on this really briefly and talk about course plans. This is a course plan if you want to do a Bachelor of Science and major in computing and software systems. The design one looks quite similar. Uh, what you'd see here is we have 11 subjects here, four in the first year, three in the second year, four in the others. And then you can take some electives, which are science or IT electives, and some breadth. Uh, the important thing to note here is there's not enough IT electives to fill up all your science electives. You will be said that you have to do something a little bit different. Okay? It could be maths, it's not that much different, or it could be data science, it's not that much different, or it can be wildly different like genetics. But you have to fill up some of these electives, and there's not enough of ours. And that is just forcing people to think about the world from a different angle. That's part of the Melbourne model. And then, in addition to that, you have to take some breadth. So, if you're not familiar with this, you have to take at least four subjects over your degree. We encourage people to take six. And breadth says any subject that's offered out science, outside of the Bachelor of Science, really, or, or at least there is a list of subjects, and most of those are subjects offered in other degrees. So it could be business, could be languages, could be design if you're in this, this one here in their office. It can be quite different. And that is really about getting a very different viewpoint on the world. So you can complement it with something really strict, like yes, I want to do this and do business, and that complements really well. Or look, I just want to study French, and there's a stream of six subjects I can do in French. Either, either way, that's going to help you broaden your horizons, uh, and that's what we're trying to do, is just let people take something slightly different. And you have to take at least four of those. Different schools have different ways of doing things. For example, there are certain subjects, there's a six subject sequence of business subjects that's, yeah, just take these in, in sequence and you get a nice package. We have a package in IT for people in other, other, other degrees that can take a, a stream of subjects as breadth. And that's all it's about. 
Um, I don't want to focus too much on the subjects we, we study here, but just to note, that is the 11 minimal subjects. We've got some IT electives, but we won't have enough to fill up your first and second year. At third year, there's, there's a heap we can take, that you can take many. Okay, I'm not going to talk about the master here. The other major that people might be interested in is digital technologies, which is in the design degree, which is more around building user experience. So not how do we really program the back end, it's really about, okay, we, you do get some programming ability here, but it's really about how do we design the experiences that users want. How do we discover what they want, and how do we design the system that gives them those experiences. Okay, and this is then you come user experience design, designer, mobile app designer, multimedia programmer, so it's much more on that front end. We have to worry about the person using it a lot more. Okay, because um, we started a bit late, uh, I'm not going to go over this much, but just say the design is very similar. There's 12 subjects here you have to do, you have to take some subjects that are not computer science subjects and do design electives, graphic design, these kind of things. Okay, uh, and then the last major I want to talk briefly about is data science. So as I said, we're now producing more data than we have every year than pretty much the rest of the history and of human history, but the question is how do we actually deal with that data? When we're talking about terabytes of data, how can we gain inferences and make insights from it? And the data science major and, and the, the masters that comes out of it really came out of the fact that data science is about computer science and statistics being put together. And what people were doing when they needed data scientists were employing mostly computer scientists who knew a little bit about stats and had to catch up and that worked okay. Well, sometimes they employed statisticians who knew a little bit about programming and that kind of didn't work as well, but it worked okay. Now this is a degree that says actually it's really just computer science and stats and the first two years look are effectively just computer science and just stats, and the final year is really uh, builds the, the whole major. Uh, I don't want to go into too much of that. All I wanted to show you is that the design is very similar, but I want to point out one thing here, is that you have to take four subjects in your first year to achieve data science. Two com computing subjects, foundations of computing and foundations of algorithms, two math subjects. It's exactly the same two subjects you have to take in the computing and software systems major. And it's exactly the same subjects you have to take in Bachelor of Design Computing. So if you came into des science, for example, if you take these four subjects here, you leave open several majors, computing and software systems, you leave open data science, and you also leave open three majors for maths, which all start with these two subjects here, which I can't, operations research, statistics, and pure maths, maybe a fourth one as well. This is about leaving pathways open after your first year. If you take those four subjects, you have a lot of options. Computational biology is another one. Okay, um, I, I'm not going to talk too much about IT as breadth, but this is effectively if some of you are here and you're thinking about taking, for example, a commerce degree or something like that, you can fill up your breadth with some of our IT subjects. These are, for the most part, the same subjects you take in the science degree. Here, so you do some introduction to computing, which is the subject on the top right here, and you take some other things. And if you take your prereq, if you line up your prereqs well, you can do some reasonably advanced computer science in your, your third year, although the, the options are more limited. Okay, there is an employment panel, maybe the panel's already been, I uh, can't remember, a careers panel from, from one of our associate professors here is going to talk a bit about careers, but you can see over the last uh, couple of decades, really the, the, the trend for computer science is, is upward. If you remember, if, you, if you're old enough to remember like me, the IT um, bubble that burst in the early noughties, is here, right? So even a very effective burst that, that was very bad for people studying IT it didn't have a really big impact on the employment um, outcomes for people that did study it. It did have a big impact on universities and people stopped studying it for a short period. That's not a problem for us right now. Okay, um, and here what, what I talk about is employment outcomes. What most of our students do is a Master of Engineering if they go into Masters and they really go to some impressive places, much much better than our bachelor students go to the Master of Engineering and the Master of Computer Science. And they go to Microsoft Redmond and they go to Facebook and they go to Google and they go to those big types of companies as well. But also some of them go and start up their own companies, go and work at consultants at Accenture. They go everywhere when they come out of those masters. But they go to some truly impressive places uh, and we're sort of really proud of the cohort that we, the, the alumni that we've developed in, in this place. Um, People who come out of bachelors, they can do well, they can get a job, but they don't go as far as our master's graduates, we find. So 
with employment outcomes, I said earlier, we're number seven uh, for employability here. 93% of our graduates are employed within four months uh, of graduating across our, our all of our majors and, and degrees here. And we actively have people coming on campus to recruit. So we have careers fairs where there's lots of people around you can go and talk, but especially in computer science now, there's a big trend of companies coming in just by themselves for a day and working with the computing uh, students association to give advice about internships during the degree or ways to apply for different um, graduate programs when they graduate. And we're seeing that really strong here, the competitiveness for our graduates. Um, we're being targeted specifically by, by big companies. Okay, I'm not going to talk too much about masters, but I will talk quickly about fees and funding. Okay, so there are CSP places available um, for the students here. If you come through, you get into Melbourne as a Bachelor of Science. If you complete the undergraduate major with a score of, of an average score of 65, you'll be granted entry into any of our master's programs, Master of Computer Science, Master of IT, Master of Software Engineering, these types of things, and there are fee places available. If you want more information about that, you can go downstairs to the course advisors who know a lot more about admissions than the academic staff too. Um, and there's a few scholarships available, some you can apply for, some you will just be automatically considered for. So there are various things, chancellor scholarships for people with a really high ATAR, people from rural communities, these types of things, various different scholarships.